All right, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Mob Museum. Uh, my name is Jeff Schumacher. I'm the Vice President of Exhibits and Programs here. And uh, really looking forward to a great uh, conversation tonight. Um, great crowd, great turnout. Appreciate that very much. You know, we're, we're working our way out of this thing, and it's so great to be able to bring, you know, people back together to talk about interesting topics and, and uh, allow you to ask your questions as well. Um, tonight's program will be a conversation with Ori Spado, who has written a new memoir called The Accidental Gangster, From Insurance Salesman to Hollywood Fixer. And we'll deal with all of that tonight. As you will soon hear, Ori's life has taken some fascinating twists and turns. And along the way, he's crossed paths with well-known names from the world of organized crime, as well as the world of entertainment. Uh, please join me in welcoming Ori Spado to the Mod Museum. <laughs> So, so I'm going to ask Ori some questions, uh, and then we'll, we'll just have a conversation, and then afterward, we'll have an opportunity for everyone here to ask some questions of, our, of Ori as well. Uh, when we do that, we have a microphone off to the side, and so if you would raise your hand or, or come over to the microphone, we'll, we'll have you come over. Uh, we do that because we're, this is live streamed on the internet, so uh, welcome to everybody out there in, in internet land. Uh, they want to be able to hear your questions as well. So the only way to do that is if you speak into a microphone or else it just doesn't pick up. So uh, thank you for that. And um, let's get started. Uh, I, I have one other note. After we're done with the Q&A, Ori will go downstairs and we'll have a good old-fashioned book signing. So uh, we, his books are for sale in the, uh, in the retail store on the first floor. And he'll be, he'll be stationed down there and, and sign your book for you and scribe it to, you know, you, your mother, anyone you want uh, for Christmas or any other occasion. So uh, looking forward to getting back to that practice as well. Welcome, Ori. How are you doing? Good. Good, good evening. <laughs> uh, I'm very good, Jeff. And if I may, I'd like to thank everybody. Or go ahead and bring them, if they want to bring the microphone up so they can hear you, though. Yeah, I'd like to thank everybody uh, for coming. Appreciate that. Thank you. All right. Now, your, your story is an interesting one. Are you, you're not necessarily a household name yet uh, <laughs> in the world of organized crime, but you intersected with so many interesting individuals over time uh, that your story is just incredible. Um, but let's start at the beginning, because you grew up as in a small town in New York. Tell us about that. Well, I was born in upstate New York in a city called Rome, New York, which is right in the center of New York State. Uh, I had a good upbringing. I had a mom and dad. Uh, of course, we didn't have a lot of money. Uh, my mom was a half. I had two brothers, three sisters, but my mom, we lived in a duplex home. My grandparents, aunts and uncles, on the other side, my mother cooked for 13 people every night. Uh, I had an up, a, a good, I, Rome, New York was a great city. Uh, and most of you probably know where it is by now. <laughs> <laughs> well, and so I think what's interesting then would be to kind of explain how you got from this, this relatively small town in, in upstate New York uh, into, you know, sort of got yourself involved with people involved in organized crime. How did that all start? Well, you know, all my life in upstate New York, you see the sun a couple of days a year. Uh, and when you see snow, it's higher than this building. So I knew there were better parts of the world. When it was about 12, 13, a friend of mine, uh, his parents moved to uh, Greenport, Long Island. And they invited me there for a month, and I loved it. And my parents used to, their big vacation was going to New York once a year to see the place. They came, picked me up, and brought me to New York City. And I'll never forget looking at those giant buildings. I just fell in love with them. And even to this day, I can have buildings, I can have activity around me. I like the hum of cars going down the street. I'm not a country boy. And uh, at the age of 18, I joined the Army, uh, ended up stationed with the 25th Infantry Division, Schofield Barracks, Hawaii, and 
from then on I knew I needed to be in a land of sunshine. <laughs> and, but when I got out of the Army, there's certain little things that I'll leave out, and you can read it in my book. Uh, but I ended up, my, my dad was ill. I uh, went, flew back to, to Rome. And I remember sitting with my father. He said, you should not have come back. There's nothing here for you. You should have stayed in Los Angeles. And I said, well, Dad, my, and my father worked at Revere Copper and Brett. He was one of the founders of uh, the union there uh, back in the day. I said, give me a job at Revere. I'll work there a month. I'll save all my money go back to California. And and I, he got me a job. I took the night shift. I hated it. And when I got paid on Fridays, I went out and I blew it all. So at the end of three weeks and three days, exactly, I had no money to save. And I told my supervisor, I said, I give you my two week notice. He said, well, look it, all right. He said, you're Joe Spado's son. You want to leave tonight, go ahead. I said, goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> And I ended up with another job in uh, airline, they made airline parts, uh, Kelsey Hayes in Utica, that was a short period of time. But then I got into the insurance business. And for some reason, I was with the Prudential, it just came very easy to me, I grasped it, and I was an extremely good salesman. I became a member of the Million Dollar Roundtable for several years. And, uh, then I ended up having created my own agency, the Ori Agency, where I was doing in the uh, 70s, early 70s, over three and a half million dollars a year. I had a real estate company, and uh, I sold Polyglyco Corporation, another company I had. And I was doing extremely well until I got my first indictment. And that was in Syracuse, New York, and they took my insurance license away, and I got five years supervised release or parole, whatever they call it nowadays. Well, Rory, so so uh, something something happened here. <laughs> you were going from you know the straight laced insurance guy to something a little different. What what was happening? Well, you know, when they took my license, one thing that I believe in, I, I'm a hustler. At age 76. I wake up every day and I gotta do something. I wake up at four or five a.m. and I'm working till nine o'clock at night because I feel if I retired, I'm gonna die. And you know, I, I wanna stick around a few more years uh, to build up that big name that Jeff said I don't have yet. <laughs> so. Uh, Strike one for Jeff. <laughs> um, uh, but I mean, not every insurance agent gets himself indicted. So what exactly kind of got you there? Well, you know, it was the weirdest thing because, you know, back in those days, we had upstate New York to Albany and uh, New York City. We had a pretty locked down politically. So I knew I was not going to be indicted uh, by the county, the state, or anything. And uh, but four and a half, six months before the statute of a limitation would have ran out. I got indicted on 11 counts of mail fraud. And I was living in, out here in Los Angeles, and I used to take my messages on Friday that a friend of mine had a hair salon in, in Hollywood. And I went there and the girl said, you gotta call your lawyer. And I called Louie and he said, you've been indicted, 11 counts of mail fraud. I told him that you turn yourself in, you gotta be in court in Syracuse Wednesday. I said, mail fraud, how the hell is this mail fraud? Because insurance automobile dealer would send me a monthly statement along with a check. It's a standard practice. And I, wa I was living between uh, LA and San Francisco where my second wife was. And I remember going to the law library in San Francisco and I started studying. One thing about me, when something happens, I'm gonna study it and I'm gonna find out. And 
what mail fraud is. I mean, cause it just blew my mind. And I read a case where a guy broke up with his girlfriend and said, don't worry, I'll take care of you. I'll send you a few bucks every week. And he did. And when he felt he sent her enough, she sued him, got him indicted for mail fraud. Yeah, so these laws that we have in this country uh, is something you're going to hear more about coming from me uh, and a group of people that I just joined, but that's something for another time. Uh, but that was my first really uh, take. Uh, you, you were involved, I think, sort of your entree, as I understand it, to sort of the world of organized crime was a lawyer named Frank Russo. Can you talk about him? Frank Russo, uh, Frank Russo's father was the boss in upstate New York. And in those days, and even probably today, if there's anything left, uh, was always under control of Buffalo, uh, going back to Stefano Magadino, then Joe Todaro, who was a friend of mine. Uh, but Frank's father was the boss, and then my, fa my grandfather, was a skipper. He came over from Calabria. I'm Calabrese, I'm not Sicilian. And, but, you know, they didn't want it for our family, but I ended up in it uh, uh, quite by accident. I call it accident, but slowly Frank was introducing me to people in New York City. And one of the first people I ever met was Frank Costello. And I met Frank at the Waldorf Hotel. Now, one thing that Frank Russo did tell me, you don't talk unless you're spoken to. And so, and they were talking in Italian, so I didn't know what they were saying anyways. <laughs> and, uh, but when they were through, I mean, I'm sitting there, I'm looking at all the girls. And, uh, and I, Frank came over and, and he told me to call him Uncle Frank. And he says, uh, always be a gentleman. And I'll tell you, this guy was always dressed in dapper, and he was a true gentleman. And from there, we met Russell Buffalino. We had lunch with Russell in New York a couple times. Uh, then when Russell got arrested, and they were transporting him from Pennsylvania uh, to New York City, he was in Oneida County Sheriff's Department. And we used to bring him pasta, because we, in those days, Frank Russell had the Sheriff's Department, too. So, so we were we were allowed to bring in pasta, spaghetti and meatballs, and stuff like that. And just through the years, gradually, I'm meeting different people. I'm out on the street doing different things. And uh, uh, Meyer Lansky, I met him at the Warwick Hotel. He used to have the suite above me. I uh, used to walk with him in the evenings. Him and his dog down 54 to Fifth Avenue, over to 57 down to six, back to 54. We talked about all, it just, you know, really coincidentally, he was coming to New York a lot when they were just approving gambling in Atlantic City. Isn't that something? <laughs> uh, but, so, uh, so, Ari, one of the people who became really a lifelong friend for you was, was uh, meeting Sonny Francis. Can you talk about that? Sonny Francis. Uh, I became close friends with him. Walter Fison, who was the founder of Polyglyco Corporation, I don't know if any of you would remember it. It's a paint sealant, put on your car, guaranteed for three years, no need to shine your car again. We advertised all over the country. Every minute we were on TV. And Walter was getting death threats. And I told him, Walter, nobody's gonna call you up and threaten you. I said, forget about it. I said, it's Frank or something. And so he asked me to fly into New York because I was at my condo in Pompano Beach. He, and he was at his condo in Boca Raton. He asked me to fly in, called Victor Potomkin, who was one of the largest Cadillac dealers at the time. So I flew in, got there on a Monday morning, went to Victor's office, we closed him, got in Victor's limo, went to Club 21 for lunch. Well, we didn't have cell phones in those days. And Walter went to call his office, comes back, he's white as a ghost. 
and he leans over to me, he says, kid, I know you're wired in. He said, this is, something's really happening. You gotta stay till we find out. Would you do that? And he, he paid my expenses, of course. So I stayed, I called Frank Russo. He, he said, call Lou Perry, because Frank was in upstate. I called Lou Perry, he said, I'll pick you up at seven o'clock at your hotel. He picked me up, we went to a restaurant on 2nd Avenue, Trattatoria Ticciliana, which uh, was a great restaurant owned by Sonny's son-in-law, Eugene. And when I walked in, I could tell Ronnie. I just have a knack when I walk into a restaurant or any place, I could look around, I know who's sitting where and so forth. I, I don't know, it just comes naturally. And maybe it's just something we do from the streets. But I met with Sonny and he was with his son, Johnny Franche, just a young kid. His daughter, Tina, his daughter, Gia, and his wife, Christina, that everybody called her Gina. And I sat next to Sonny, we whispered to each other. He took my office number, took my number in Florida, and uh, said he would check into it, get back to me. I got violently ill. I got allergic to something I ate. I mean, I was bad. He had two of his guys take me to the hospital. Johnny Matera, otherwise known as Johnny Irish, and Red Krabby, two guys that I later got to know fairly well. Uh, and I'll never forget, I'm waking up in NYU, and the doctor's saying, oh, what's his name? And these guys said, Doc, you don't need to know his name. Just take care of him, get him better. <laughs> All right, then the doctor had the nurse say, well, what's your name? I gotta put a name. Doc, you don't need to know our names either. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so what resulted was, I was gonna go back to run the five boroughs in New York for water for polyglycol. And so I took my, and there's somebody in the audience here who happens to know my second wife until I met this lady that's here. Thank you for coming. Uh, so we two weeks to drive back to New York. No phones, no nothing in those days. And I checked into the Ramada Inn in Utica, New York. When I get there and the the bellman's bringing our bags and the phone's ringing. And I'm thinking it's gotta be for the people who just checked out of the room or something like that. And it just keeps ringing, so how do I answer it? It's my friend, Tommy DeMar. Where the hell you been? He said, you gotta be in New York Monday morning. Call Frank Russo right now. I called Frank, he said, we gotta be there. Pick me up Sunday. And Sunday, I drove to New York, and we met Sonny Franchise at the Russian Tea Room on 57th Street. I had to go to Walter Fison, who happened to be in New York, and he had his stepson, Michael Franchise, which a lot of you probably know, uh, was there, and it was Michael who was making the death threats. And this was my first sit down ever in my life. And there's a rule about a sit down. Again, keep your mouth shut until spoken to. But as we're sitting there, Walter's next to me, Michael's next to Sonny, Lou Perry and Frank Russo in the aisle. And, and this is before the restaurant opened too, folks. Uh, and the other booth on the other side when the restaurant did open, was Jacqueline Kennedy's. So, anyways, I didn't think Sonny was understanding it. So I said, Sonny, let me, let me put this in terms you might understand. I said, let's suppose somebody's moving in under your territory in the Bronx. And I'm gonna tell you folks, if eyes could kill, I'd be dead right now. You never seen eyes look at you like those eyes. And he said, don't think for one moment, I do not know what's going on here. 
keep your mouth shut. You're young. I'm going to forget about this. And it went on, and Sonny sided with us. We won that sit-down. When we left, we're all walking outside. Sonny grabs my arm, walks me down the corner of Broadway and 57th, and he says, kid, I love you. He said, you got balls. He said, from now on, you're with me. He said, anywhere in the country you go, you're with me. You understand? And I want you and your family at my home for Christmas. And that became a relationship of over 40 years, right up to his death a little over a year ago at the age of 103. And uh, we'll, we'll come back to, to Sonny a little bit later. Uh, but I, I thought what we, could, uh, what we could do is sort of touch on some of the different individuals you cross paths with over time, sure. and also some of the different uh, uh, schemes that you got involved in, uh, that some of which were your ideas, some were other people's ideas, but all uh, pretty interesting. Okay. Um, so w w there's just some names that you know popped out when I read the book. And so we can start with this one. So uh, Joe, Joe Dogs Iannuzzi, what happened with him? Oh, Joe Dogs. A lot of you probably heard of Joe Dogs. He put a lot of people away. Uh, I spoke to you about my lawyer. My lawyer at that time in upstate New York, he was rated the number three criminal lawyer in the state of New York. And at that time, obviously down in Florida, uh, with all the heavy drugs, he wanted to, he passed the bar, but they would not give him his license to pass the bar because of uh, uh, a flyer in Utica, New York, uh, under suspicious things. <laughs> uh, so, you know, he, he ended up staying with me in my condo, then he got a condo in, uh, on St. Lorana, which he still does have, probably with my money. And uh, he's meeting these different guys, and he, these guys are taking, different wise guys, and they're taking money from him. And one day he calls me up, and he says he wanted me to meet somebody, and I went, and I went with my, she wasn't my wife yet, Rosemary. Uh, we went off. He was with his wife, Jackie, and a guy named Joe Dog, Joe Iannuzzi. And we had dinner, and Joe's trying to grab Louis for money, and he, and he was a good, Joe Iannuzzi was a tough guy. There's no question about it. Uh, but he made a mistake on something. When I went to the men's room, he tried to hit on my wife or my girlfriend. Now, she didn't tell me nothing as soon as I, she told me on the way home. That made my antennas go. Now, at the same time, you got to understand, I'm under indictment. I got to hustle a living. And I was going to start a business down in Florida, uh, prostitution uh, business. And it was going to be out of Dade County but I wanted the telephones when they rang out a day to ring into Broward County. And Joe said, oh, I'm gonna get you all the hotels on the beach, the diplomat, the fountain blue, I'm connected, don't worry. And uh, he sets me up, he said, I got an office for you to set the business up where the telephone lines will go. It's okay. And he had this guy meet me, and I met him at Stan's in Fort Lauderdale. And something suspicious, because I just felt something in my gut, like I said. And if I listened to my gut, and I listened to Joe Riccardi over here, all uh, right, I probably wouldn't be up here talking. <laughs> but anyhow, uh, a lot of times in life we don't listen. Uh, I, I, instead of giving my car to the valet, I parked it across the street and I watched the cars come in. And when the guy I met came in, came in in a new car with the stickers still on the, on the window. And that's a tactic the FBI used to use years ago because they had able to get cars from car dealers when they fly into town and so forth. And the guy brings me out, I went in, I met him, 
got in his car, we drove to an office, it's supposed to be a real estate company. And when we walked in, there's nobody there. But there's desk lined up. A full, a yellow pad, a pen, all on every desk, just like in the military, lined up perfectly. And I looked at this guy and I said, you know, I said, I'm going to move to California. I decided I'm not going to do this. <laughs> you know how I found out that he went, I mean, I found Joe Dodd became an informant, uh, put a lot of guys uh, away. But when the Secret Service picked me up once in Los Angeles, and they're questioning me to say that I was picked up for prostitution. So that's when I know that guy was a rat or an FBI agent. So my gut saved me on that one. But uh, so my jacket was wrong on that case. Uh, so yeah, I'll drop a couple other names and we can talk about them. Somebody who became your good friend uh, was a guy named Jimmy Kachi. He was at the, the LA mob. And uh, he spent a lot of time in Las Vegas. Uh, he did and was involved in some things here. Can you talk a little bit about him? Jimmy Kachi was probably one of the best gentlemen he ever wanted to meet. Jimmy was originally from Buffalo, close friends with Joe Todaro, and he was a skipper, and he was the underboss of Los Angeles. He and I became extremely close friends. I mean, people, and we actually, you know, because having that upstate New York accent, we'd be out, people thought we were brothers. And he did have a brother. Bobby Milano was a big singer, uh, married to Keely Smith, great guy. His real name was Charlie Kachi. And uh, Jimmy lived in Palm Springs. We did an awful lot of things together, Jimmy and I. Not only in Los Angeles, but Las Vegas. We used to take, I picked Jimmy up. We used to take the back roads. I can't even find him. Jimmy could get here blindfolded. Uh, but uh, we did an awful lot of things. There, there. Was a, there was an epic road trip I remember reading about. Uh, can you talk about that? Oh, me and Jimmy were going back to New York. He was bringing his car. He was giving it to his grandson in Buffalo. And we had some other things that we had to do. We just came off a big score, and somehow uh, the way I did things and I manipulated the money, I had the money with my daughter. <laughs> so, you know, Jimmy had to get his end from when we got back to New York. And so I picked Jimmy up. I, I drive to Palm Springs. We get in Jimmy's car. We drive. The first place we go is to Arizona. Jimmy had some friends, owned a restaurant, some other guys from Arizona. We stayed overnight there. Next day, got on the road. And there's a true saying about Jimmy Kachi. If Jimmy Kachi asks you to take a ride, don't get in his car, because you're going to end up in Buffalo, New York. <laughs> uh, but Jimmy, we, we stopped New Orleans, Fort Lauderdale, then New York City, uh, where uh, we met a lot of guys, rails were here and there, and then finally to my daughters, uh, the day before Christmas Eve, the 23rd of December. I give Jimmy his money. Jimmy loved the horses. His nickname was Horse. I give his money. Whenever I made a score, the first people I took care of, make, give my kids some money, my mother, so forth. And I had to go into Buffalo, and I went there after Christmas. And... Jimmy picks me up, brings me to the hotel, and he says, I'll pick you up in the morning. I said, okay. Now in the morning, he calls me. He said, look, it picked me up on, and I can't remember the street, but I knew, I knew there was an OTB parlor there. So I took the taxi, and Jimmy's pacing up and forth, back and forth in front of the place. And I get out, 
I go, Jimmy, please don't tell me you fucking lost all the money. <laughs> and he did. He said, give me, he had a magic number, $240. He said, well, 140 grand. I said, Jimmy, I'm not giving you the money. I said, this, we got to get to Chicago. We got to do what we got to do there. And, uh, but I stayed in Buffalo. And I mean, it, it, it's in my book. There's some funny stories about when the police stopped us for a DUI uh, or, or, or something. But they didn't give a ticket to Jimmy. They brought us to the police station and just had us sitting on benches like those. And I, I'll never forget, you know, I said, look, I could drive, he can't. They said, you could drive, take the test. And they put me through the test, test my, I fell. <laughs> they said, you ain't driving. Thank God Jimmy's brother-in-law came and got us. And well, we sobered up, and now we went to Chicago to do what we had to do. And in the meantime, every place we were at, the FBI knew every place. And the FBI thought that I took my button to become a made member and that Jimmy was bringing me around the country to become a made man. But, uh, yeah, quite a, Jimmy, the last time I spoke to Jimmy Kashi, I was in prison at Lompoc. I remember calling him up and I could tell through his voice. He just got out of the hospital. And I told him, I said, Jimmy, you gotta call Betty. You gotta get back, see the doctor. I said, let me know. I said, I'll keep calling you. And after that, I called, I called. For weeks I'm calling, no answer. And then I called and the phone is shut off. And that's how I knew Jimmy Kotze passed away. Eventually his sister and his son got a hold of me and let me know. But that's how, yeah, Jimmy was, uh, and the arguments with Sonny Franchese I have, Sonny would say, you're with me in New York, and Jimmy saying, you're with me, fuck Sonny Franchese, and going back and forth. Uh, but yeah, that's Jimmy Kachi, uh, a really good guy. I love him. And you know, folks, I, and I wanna make this here statement. You know, I don't talk bad about anybody in my book, except maybe for a couple confidential informants. You know, these people were my friends. They were good people. And what people don't realize, you know, they think gam gamber, they think we live a glamorous life. It's not a glamorous life, folks, all right? I talked about hustling in the insurance business, hustling on the streets. Imagine waking up every morning, because we're not civilians like most people here. We gotta make a living every day get up, you gotta think, you gotta do it while you're being followed by the FBI, LAPD, gangster squad. It's not easy, okay? So I want you to know that. <laughs> <laughs> we'll come back to some of that as well, but I, I think one of the, the more, uh, I don't know, unusual uh, 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 things that you did was robbing the jail. Can you talk about that? Well, a lot of people in Los Angeles know me as the guy who robbed the L.A. City Jail. <laughs> Cable boxes. This was a very interesting situation. We had some buyers out of Florida uh, that were looking for cable boxes. And uh, one day, it was a Sunday, I'm gonna cut it, cut it short. Uh, a friend of mine in the entertainment business he did, uh, he blew up cars and those stuff. He had his own semi, and on a Sunday morning, his wife called me. He says, Kevin found the cable boxes. They're at the LA City Jail, they're filming a movie. I said, tell him to put his Benny in his truck as he can and bring him home. And I called my friend Jerry Zimmerman. We went to the house that night, then we had the cable boxes transported to a warehouse. We had the guys come in from Florida, We'll take this one, this one, this one, boom, 15 grand. Now, by this time, I know how many cable boxes are in there. I made one trip. Now, the L old LA City Jail sits right across from the police academy uh, in Los Angeles. 
And on one end, they allow people in the industry to film. A lot of movies you see, they probably show that jail. The other end, they had a little uh, a gym uh, for people, uh, you know, in the gangs and so forth. A lot of them were there. And we actually changed the locks and had our own locks. And I did everything. Jimmy, Jerry Zimmerman was my buffer. And, and when I say buffer, I didn't make the appearance. I had Jerry go, he did this, he did that. And I decided the way I'm going to get these cable boxes is I'm going to film a movie or a TV show, whatever. But it was all bullshit. Um, <laughs> so we really had a producer. I actually, we had real live actors. I had a food wagon like you can't believe. I'm at a hotel across the hall from me. I got the guys from Florida with the cash. And I had four trucks, big trucks, ready. And I told Jerry, have that producer shut that set down at midnight. And in the meantime, part of the thing, I had my special effects guy doing a smoke screen. So the actors are acting, but behind the smoke screen is all my people taking the things outside the cells. <laughs> At 12 o'clock, this producer, he's kidding me, he's drinking. I'm yelling like a bastard. I said, I'm gonna kill that fucker, shut down. <laughs> all right, now I have my lookout guys on motorcycles at the police academy, because it sat right across from the LA River. And needless to say, we, the, three of the trucks left, 4 a.m. in the morning, finally shut down. We only had two hours to get what we could. And I broke about even, because with the cable boxes that they did get, I got about another 40 grand. All right, so now I still gotta get them. I'm trying to think how I'm gonna get them. They're still sitting there. And a friend of mine introduces me to a guy that says he's the vice president of Comcast out in the valley. I met the guy at a restaurant in Burbank. And we're talking and he told me, and those of you who don't know about the cable business, you all got cable box at home. But in the old days when you would steal them, there were normally inside jobs. You know, you were the vice president of the company, you say, hey, uh, you know, 50 cable boxes going to this guy, you give me the paperwork, I pull up with my truck, I hand it out the window, go to bin 32, and all right, they load it up and you drive out. Uh, those were the simple ones. But this one was tricky, so I decided the way I gotta do this, I need a corridor there. And every time I'm talking to this guy, by this time, I found out that there was a police officer, a detective, that was having those guys from the gang stealing a few boxes at a time and selling them on the street for $300, which was about the right price on the street. But I'm looking at a few million dollars worth of them. So now every time I'm talking to this guy, I keep mentioning this cop's name. I keep mentioning, I said, we gotta get it before that cop gets it. He's a dirty cop, dirty cop. This guy was wired up from the second meeting I had with him. And finally, one day he tells me he's got the court order. And I meet him on a Thursday. I had a date with a beautiful actress. I was all dressed up. And I went to the restaurant. He had the paper. I said, you gotta change the date. I said, can't do it tomorrow. It's got to be Monday. And he leaves the papers and he leaves. And, you know, there's nobody else in the restaurant at his hours between lunch and dinner. And my car is the only one in the parking lot. I walk out to my car and I hear these cars converge on me. I turn around. They're all private cars, no police cars. And one car pulls up, takes me, puts the cuffs on me and puts me in the front seat. Anybody that's ever been arrested, they don't put you in the front seat of their private cars, okay? Just don't do that. And he drove away and he told the other guys, you know what to do. 
I had no idea what that meant. And drove away and he's driving with me. This is on Burbank. And he's driving and driving. The next thing I know, he pulls into Griffith Park. And now I'm thinking, I don't know, I'm talking to myself. And now he gets on the dirt road. And at this point, I said, Lori, you got to say something. So I said, excuse me, detective. I don't know of any precinct here in Griffith Park. <laughs> he says, shut up, you guinea bastard. You know who I am? I said, I have no idea. He says, I'm, and I'm not going to say his name. Maybe he's there. Uh, I'm so-and-so. You've been blaring my name all over the wire. My response was, well, you shouldn't have wired the fucking guy up. <laughs> but one cop at the scene screwed up because I was known, well known by the gangster squad in Los Angeles, which is really exists. You all seen the movie about it with Sean Penn really exist. One cop went over the two-way radio, so we got Ori Spado, Sulin Bannister, the main guys from the LAPD OIC, heard it, and they said, you get Spado down to Parker Center. And folks, I gotta tell you, I was never so happy to see a police station, <laughs> all right? Because if that did not occur, trust me, I'd be dust buried in Griffith Park today. Uh, just to wrap that one up, I mean, you were you did get charged for the cable box deal, and did you get you didn't go to jail though? I didn't go to jail because the guy that was wired up was a pedophile, and they didn't want to use him at trial, and they offered me uh, three years probation. I took it, state probation. So. So, um, there, you know, there's so much in this book, and we won't get, to, we, we even shouldn't get to it all in one sitting, but I do want to touch on the Hollywood fixer part of this, of your subtitle, because later you became really involved, a little bit more involved with the entertainment industry and helping people out in different ways. Um, kind of explain that, that Hollywood fixer label. Well, you know, it was just, I have a fairly good knack of talking. Uh, motivating people to do the proper thing. And I was friends with Dino De Laurentiis, Ralph Serpy, uh, and their offices were at Cannon Drive in Beverly Hills. We were sitting there one day, and this was back in the 70s, and they were having a problem, a, a film was going behind budget. Some actor was giving, a very, giving the director a very difficult time which happens often in, in Hollywood. And I just volunteered. I said, well, I'll handle it. Let me go talk to the guy. I can convince him to do the right thing. It was really going behind budget. And, you know, they, they want these films to come in on budget. So I went and I handled it very nicely. I took them in. I made them understand. I did it in terms that he understood. <laughs> and, you know, it worked out good. They were happy. And... They talked to me of the other people, and surely other people were calling me, agents, lawyers, studios, and I had done a lot of favors for a lot of people in Hollywood. I never discussed their names. Uh, that was part of just me. I don't like to mention a lot of names. I do mention one name in my book, and that's for a very specific reason. I can get into it why I mentioned Naomi Campbell's name. Uh, but I'm the guy, I kept the stalker away from her. I found him. The hardest thing is to find somebody. And I was able to find a guy who was in Long Island. I sent a couple guys to go visit the guy. They put him on the phone with me. And uh, I talked to him over the phone. And I motivated him properly to never ever even think of Naomi Campbell again. And that was successful. We never heard from him again. Uh, the big action TV star, you all would know his name. 
I don't like the guy, but you know, he, uh, uh, ICM was holding up $2 million of his money uh, because the producers would not sign off. They weren't, they wanted something resolved. And I had to sit down and I met, met them at the Four Seasons. The Four Seasons was my place in, in Hollywood. I was there almost every night. And uh, I handled that problem. The guy got the two million, got it released. Uh, a lot of times in the old days, you might hear maybe uh, Joe and Betty, big movie stars getting divorced, big scandal, and then all of a sudden, you don't hear nothing about it. And when that occurred, normally Ori Spader spoke to him. So those are kind of things, folks. Uh, it's a, a great life, uh, but it's not a glamorous life, okay? Was it an accident or was it my destiny? It was my destiny. I take full responsibility for everything I did in my life, good, bad, or indifferent. So um, the big, there was a big moment we need to get to, which was, I think it was June 4th, I think, 2008. Uh, big announcements, uh, FBI announces uh, 12 indictments, uh, Colombo crime family indictments, including uh, Sonny Frances, um, and a number of other individuals, uh, one of whom was Ori Spada. That's right. <laughs> how, did, how did you get uh, mixed up with this indictment, uh, with this whole uh, bust? Well, look, at one thing, I'll tell you something. Anybody, in, in my book, I state, if I could help one young man stay out of a life of crime, my book was well worth it. I have helped several. I'm doing a lot more. I'm talking to the charter school system, I'm going to school in Los Angeles. Uh, those are the kind of things I'm doing. 1997, the FBI in Los Angeles said, we will see the day you are chained, shackled, put on Con Air, and brought to Brooklyn. In June of 2008, they made it a reality. And they arrested me, chained me, shackled me, put me on Con Air, brought me to Brooklyn, and I was on an indictment with Sonny Franchise, the underboss, Tommy Gioli, uh, uh, acting uh, boss of the Colombo crime family, and several other people. And from that there, I had two predicate acts which they need to bring you under the unconstitutional and illegal RICO law, which is racketeering, influence, corrupt, organization was signed into law by Richard Nixon, all right, in the hopes that that law was going to stop the drugs. We all know how that worked out. <laughs> it wasn't until it became the most lethal weapon by a, another guy, like him or hate him, Rudy Giuliani who began using it, brought down all five fam crime families in New York. I had two predicate acts. One was cocaine conspiracy, 50 kilos or more. That's life in prison. The other one was a home invasion robbery in Burbank. I don't know why I love Burbank so much. Uh, all right, there's supposedly a million dollars in a safe. And uh, those were my two predicate acts. And I ended up back in Brooklyn uh, with it. everybody in that indictment. At the same time, they had uh, indictments of the other four crime families. And MDC Brooklyn uh, was full of Italians. You ended up, yeah, you, were, you were considering going to trial, uh, but you ended up pleading guilty. How did that all play out? Well, I was offered, they never ch changed them. The, uh, from the first day, my first lawyer, I went through four lawyers, said I can get you 97 to 101 months. I said, I'm not interested, not interested. They went right through that after 30 months in Brooklyn. And then my lawyer said, you gotta take this. And I, I thought about it. 
and I was in the bullpen under the courthouse in Brooklyn uh, with a guy named Atiko, who was a skipper with a Genovese family, and he says, Spado, take that goddamn plea. He said, if you don't take that plea, you're going to shut your lights out at trial. And he was right. I took the plea, and I took, I signed on for the 97 to 101 months, and uh, figuring I get the low end. But I was very fortunate because when I went to for sentencing, my judge says, Mrs. Spado, when I send guys like you and organized crime, I feel like I'm individual. I'm, I'm sentencing two different people. He says, on one hand, we got the nicest guy in the world, takes care of his friends and his family. He said, but on the other hand, he said, anybody can dispatch people anywhere in the world is a very violent person. He said, on the robbery charge, I'm sentencing you to 60 days. It was supposed to be 36 months, 37, whatever. And I leaned over to my lawyer, I said, did he say 60 days? He was, he said, Mr. Spado, on the 924C gun charge, my hands are tied by Congress. It is a 60 month sentence. So therefore your sentence is 62 months. I couldn't believe it. And that's what I got. I got 62 months. And the U.S. attorney jumped on the desk yelling and screaming. And he looked at her and he said, as far as I'm concerned, you charged Mr. Spado twice for the same crime. It's 62 months. And I finished my time out at Lompoc, up in Northern California. I did all five years, never informed against nobody, not in my blood. I was not taught that by Sonny Franchese or any of these other people. It was a lesson that my father instilled in me when I was young. I want to make that clear. So uh, you served uh, time, and and then, I mean, you made a decision somewhere in there that you were going to leave this life of crime and take a different route. How did that all come to play? Well, you know, we had over 3,500 hours of discovery. That's 3,500 hours of wiretap. I was on 11. If you're on one wiretap, that's one too much. And here I am in California, and I'm listening to these things with my Cody friend, and I'm hearing all my friends talk. Every god other goddamn word out of their mouth was Dory Spadel. Look how he lives in California. Everybody knows him in Beverly Hill. And you know, the jealousy was, I can't even begin to tell you. But you know what, I knew the life was dead. There was no future. I promised my children, my, my children were there. Financially, making sure I had money in my commissary, one gentleman over here, that was about it. And my friends in London, yes, my friends in London are the best in the world. They're great guys over there. Nobody else was helping me. Nothing coming from New York. And I'm an avid reader, and I read and all my life. So I read, I did my time in prison. I was well respected on the yard, like most Italian gangsters are. We're respected on the yard, as long as you're not an informant. And I had no problems. I did my time. I got out, promised my children no more. And I ended up writing my book. And here I am today at the Mob Museum in Las Vegas, folks. <laughs> So does this still make me a gangster? <laughs> well, thank you, Ori. This has been really interesting. Uh, I, I imagine people have some questions. And if you do, 
uh, please go ahead and come over to the microphone and, and ask. And, you know, I'm sure we're always open for most any question that, it, that you might have. Um, you, take your time. <laughs> Here's one. Come on up. Hi, Ori. Sorry, hey, I can't resist doing? the microphone. I was hoping you'd tell the story when you were a young man in the military and you tried to extort a brothel. Oh, my God. You know, I've had a lot of people want to kill me. I don't know why. I think I'm a nice guy. When I was in, uh, in, in stationed in the Army in Hawaii, um, Schofield Barracks, uh, there's a friend, Harry and Joe. And Harry said, hey, they come, you know, look, we're young, we're 18 years old, you know, uh, full of viral or high testosterone levels. And he said, look at my friend, he runs his cat house in Wyowa. And, you know, if we send guys there, we can get girls for free. And I sat there and I thought about it. I said, look, we're in Waikiki. We got Waikiki here, because I was there every weekend. Every day, almost. I said, we got all the girls we want. Why do we got to go pay for them? I said, is this guy making a lot of money? Yeah, he's got a lot of girls. I said, I think we should get an end of it. I'm 18 years old, I'm thinking like this. I don't know why, okay? But it was just something that interested me. And uh, so, be, make it the long, make it short story. I started talking to the guys. I had Joe and Harry going to back me up. I got no problem, right? So I'm talking to the guy, and uh, finally he takes a meeting with me, and I pick him up. I'll never forget driving to the house. I had to borrow somebody's car. I drive the house, and I'm sitting there, and the girls are coming out on the porch. Oh, come on in, Ori, come on in, whatever you want. No, thank you. All right, and so we get in the car, and we ended up in the sugar cane fields. When the guy put a gun out, put my head, he was gonna kill me. And he told me I had no idea what I was dealing with and this shit. And I just came back with it. I said, oh, go ahead. I, I highly recommend, pull that trigger. I said, but uh, tomorrow go find you in the fucking water and you'll be cut to pieces. I came out with something. And it worked. And, you know, I'm here again. So, I don't think it's been nine times, so I'm sticking around, folks, till I'm 105. Anyway, so anyway, long story short, uh, he tells me he's not the big guy. The big guys were, were down in Waikiki and Hilton Head, and they had houses all over the island. So this was a seriously big operation. And now Joe and Harry back out. And I got nobody, and now the people in Waikiki at Diamond Head want to meet me. I ain't going down there. I got no backup. I'm not that crazy. And they were calling me every night. And you know, they got, it's not like I had a telephone. They had to call the charge of Porter, CQ. And finally, I told the CQ, I said, anybody call for me? Tell them I got transferred to Vietnam. <laughs> That's how I ended that one. Joe, uh, we have another question. Go ahead. Hi, you mentioned uh, Sonny Francais. They say he's a man's man. Huh? And uh, Sonny Francais, he did 50 years for, uh, I think they charged him with robbery, and to, to the day he swear he had nothing to do with it. I believe him. I know what your thoughts are on the RICO laws. What are your thoughts on law enforcement charging someone for a crime that they probably did not commit? Do you have any thoughts on Sonny Francais case particularly? You mean uh, thoughts on crime? Well, people on being in prison for things they didn't do? Correct. Okay, as far as Sonny, he didn't do the whole 50 years for that crime. Right. All right, he got out the first time after 12 years. Okay. But Sonny was probably one of the most violated individuals. And, I, and you know, I, I want to make this very clear. Sonny was not a stupid guy. Sonny was very intelligent individual, okay? Uh, did he get screwed on that? Yes. 
Absolutely. There's supposedly some information out there that he did, uh, but I don't have that. I don't know where it is. Most people are dead now. Uh, there are a lot of people in prison for things they didn't do. United States is 5% of the world's population, folks. But yet, we house 95% of all inmates, something like that. We house more prisoners than any other country. We have a penal system that's not working, it's broken down. The recidivism rate in prisons is extremely low. We are only a dollar sign to the Bureau of Prisons. They don't want to teach us things to come out of prison. Because most of the people are going to get out of prison someday. They want you to violate and go back. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, what, a follow-up question on that. Michael Frances um, said that what took down the mob was that mobsters started to fear the law more than each other. And I don't know what your view is with him. And I know he says he, he turned, but he didn't get anybody in trouble. They, I, I can't hear you. I'm so sorry. Can you hear me OK now? Yeah. So Michael Frances said that what took down the mob was that the mafia members feared the government more than other mafia members. I know that he so he turned, so to speak, but he says, I never got it. I never got anybody in trouble. I wanted to get your thoughts on just his view of what took down the mob. I think Rico had a lot to do with it in Giuliani, but uh, do you have any thoughts on him particularly and his view as what took down the mob? Well, look, at, you know, we respected law we knew they were the good guys, we were the bad guys. And we, even to this day, I still re, re, respect law enforcement. I see police officers on the street, I, I tell them I appreciate what they do, okay? We can't live in a world without having law enforcement. You cannot. All right, can we live in a world that's got fair in law enforcement? I'm all for that there. Uh, how do we change it? We change it by when we go vote. Everybody keeps voting for the same people, hoping for different results. It's like being an addict, okay? Uh, you gotta study the people that you're gonna vote for. Everybody wants to put prosecutors in the office. When Richard Nixon signed the RICO Act, he gave the Department of Justice, FBI, the ability to lie and get away with it. That's what he did. And they lied. And they set people up in crimes through their informants. My cocaine conspiracy, I never dealt cocaine. Did I deal marijuana? Yeah, I did. I mean, I didn't deal it on the streets. I mean, I would ship four or 500 pounds from Arizona to New York, you know, but uh, you know, I was never on the street with it, and you never saw, saw me around it for longer than five minutes. But my charge, the 924C gun charge, nobody ever saw me with a gun. I wasn't at the crime scene. But an informant said I gave the gun to somebody. And he swore to it. He didn't see me. We don't know if that was a real gun or a fake gun. I know he didn't see me, because I know he was on the patio of my apartment. So I knew exactly where he was. I'm not that stupid. I know what I do. And I thank the Lord I got a good memory, OK? But I got the gun charge, 60 a minimum mandatory set. Why is Congress telling judges what they got to sentence people to? Why have we got putting judges in the office? They're, it's up to them to be able to sentence them. Why are we tying their hands? And that's what's happening in this country. That's why our prisons are full. 
Worry. We've got uh, we got time for one more question. No, wait, Looks like we have. Oh, you have one more thought. Go ahead. All right. That 924C. Two years ago, the U.S. Supreme Court found out that and said that is unconstitutional and illegal and should be vacated from everybody's records. And so that that's one law that's now gone. Excellent. We have one more question. Go ahead. Familiar face, maybe. Hi, Ori. Look, how are you? I'm great. It's always great to see you. I love your book. The book is just such a ride. It's so uh, visual. You feel like, I mean, it's, we take the scary ride with you. You guys have all read the, read the book, right? It's just wonderful. But you also spoke of the fondness of several cities. Know how you love Florida. But I know how you love San Francisco. And you took many trips to Las Vegas that were quite fun and festive, weren't they? Did you, uh, I, I believe I recall one of the stories was you came here, you had a knack for the gift of luck, and you would come here, win some money, and go start up another business. Hang on, I got a, a folks, I apologize. I wondered if you had any particular Vegas story you could share that you liked. Uh, forgive me. He had to get his hearing aid fixed up. I hate wearing these with a mask, because every time I take the mask off, these want to come off. <laughs> Boy, don't film this, guys. <laughs> OK, well, go ahead. Well, I said, I was referring to how, you know, I love the book and the stories and your fondness for San Francisco and your fondness for Las Vegas. You won money, lost money, had businesses, lost money, had millions, lost money. I don't know how many times, I don't know anybody who's reinvented themselves more times than you, but could you share with us some, maybe a Vegas story? Because you were here quite a bit, yeah, living the life. I lost a lot of money. Well, you won some money, too, a couple times. I lost a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> lost, that's right. You lost a lot of money. I lost a lot of money. Uh, you know, I, Microphone. I, I hate this partition yeah. because it's like... It's, I know. I can't hear. Well, she just wants you to talk, tell a story about Las Vegas, the, something that happened to you in Las Vegas. Las Vegas. I began coming to Las Vegas in the 60s. Uh, first place I ever stayed was at Stardust. I was treated like royalty. That's when Las Vegas was really Las Vegas, folks. You walked in a casino, the, uh, the dealers, everybody, you know, they knew your name. They remembered your name. You walked in, Ori, what do you need? Want lunch? Want dinner? Go here, go there. What show you want to see? I never paid for nothing. I never paid for a room in this town. Actually, you know, because of the fact that I never pay for a room, I don't come here because I would have to pay nowadays. <laughs> All right? It's like a block in my head. Why should I have to pay? And, you know, because I got to pay, I don't want to sit down and gamble like I used to. Uh, the town has changed, folks, and, you know, every, the world is changing. We live in a changed world. Everything's technology. Uh, but this was... Most of you who don't know, I can't even begin to tell you the people that I met in this city, people who, that I knew in this city, the things I'd done in this city, uh, me, Jimmy Conchie, and some other guys, we were here a lot. And uh, I'm not going to get into that there. <laughs> but, yeah. All right, very good. Well, uh, please join me in, in thanking Ori for a great uh, conversation. Thank you. <laughs> um, we're going we're gonna to go down. I hope everybody wants to get, it, get Ori's book. It, it's for sale in the store, and he'll be, we're going to wander down to the first floor right now and uh, be available to, to sign books. So thank you all very much.